Um, looks like we are, you ready? All right. uh, looks like we're ready to go, um, 6.32ish, uh, beginning the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors meeting for Wednesday, October 5th. Um, first order of business is public comment. Um, I see Chris is here. Uh, and there's a few people on the phone. Looks like James has raised his hand. Um, anyone else on the phone want to speak? Do you, if you understand the raise hand function, go ahead and employ it. Yes. Otherwise, uh, take yourself off camera and give a little wave. Can I just ask before we start public comment? I don't think we got the warrant. Are we? Is that part of the consent agenda? Because I didn't see one come through. So maybe that process for my finance buddies. That process we talked briefly about last board meeting around having a different process because oh, okay. the auditors pointed out that it was we were out of we're not out of compliance but we we're out of order in okay. order in terms of consecutive with days and stuff so Christina is changing that process up in in response to what the order the auditors were telling got her it. and maybe it wasn't even in the consent agenda and I just got used to seeing it and, and yeah I think yeah it, it's yeah, not yeah, in there. so never mind Christina's okay, also sorry about not that. feeling well so she's she may not she may not have gotten it to where she needs to be that's okay yeah. Um, anyone from the public want to talk? I'll do room first, uh, virtual second. Go for it. And please introduce yourself for the audience. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Curtis. I'm a parent of two kids in the Montpelier schools, one in the high school, one in the middle school. And uh, I understand that you all are going to be considering the question of improvements to the athletic facilities at the high school. So I know there's been a lot of discussion in town. And as a parent of two um, student athletes, I wanted to just come forward and share my perspective on it. Um, First, I want to preface this first by just thanking you all for the time and consideration you've given to all of this. I know it's been a lengthy process already and likely to be lengthier still. Um, and there are no easy answers. So, um, and I also realize that the public schools are here to serve all of our chill health and other aspects of their educational experience, but it's not the sum total of anything. We have huge issues to address throughout the whole district and I really appreciate all the work that you all do. So. Thank you for that and for your service on the board. Um, and, you know, however you resolve all the issues related to facilities, one way or the other, it's like not going to be the end of the world one way or the other. So I'm just here uh, with a particular interest um, in exploring the possibility for adding um, a turf component to the redesign of the track because um, it's track and field, and there has to be a field to go with the track. Um, so I assume that no matter what happens with the redesign of the track, something is going to happen with the field, whether it's a grass surface uh, redesign and refill, or whether it's a turf. And I understand turf is being considered. Um, my kids have very much enjoyed experiences in other locations around the state uh, accessing turf fields. They've benefited from that use and the expanded seasonal use of turf fields. Um, and I think that there's um, a lot to be said for having that kind of a surface um, available to students that would lengthen the seasonal uh, you know, playing time available for all sports. Um, and, and I think, too, you know, it's a huge investment in the track, which is, I understand, long overdue, and I support. Um, but I think in looking at the, the numbers of students that avail themselves, and anecdotally in talking with other athletic directors around the state that manage both track uh, and field uh, infrastructure, the fields just get far more use. Um, it's year-round use because kids will come in the wintertime and sh literally shovel the field so they can play. Uh, and I think that the number of um, students participating in sports, in field sports, is actually greater in some if you add in 
soccer, which is huge. I think it's 77 high school players are playing soccer. Um, you've got uh, a large number playing softball or baseball that could access the use of the fields in their preseason for training purposes. Uh, you've got the field hockey teams. You've got lacrosse. Uh, the list just goes on and on. So when you add in all of the kids that might be able to take advantage of the extended length of time in a field that requires, frankly, in, in many ways, less maintenance than the grass, um, especially in inclement weather, um, it's just there would be a lot of kids that benefit. So it's a major investment that the board is already considering for the, for the track. I think it's sort of generational. This would be the one time if you're going to do a major re restructuring of you know, those facilities, now would be the time to do both all at once because I think if you do the one, it's very unlikely that the other is going to get addressed. Um, so I would just urge the board to think holistically. If we're going to make a major investment in the athletic facilities, just consider kind of biting the bullet and saying, hey, let's do one great facility for all kids all at one time. That would be my pitch. Um, I know there are other considerations too, and I trust the board will um, take into consideration all of the financial, environmental, and other needs of the school as you make this decision. But um, that was just my perspective on it. I love the fact that you're taking this up, and I know a lot of kids would be very excited to see that change happen. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Um, the phone have uh, James first and then Matt. Uh, and again, please introduce yourself uh, for um, the, the viewers at home. Sure. Um, I'm James Eikenberry. I am a, a parent of a track and cross country uh, student athlete and uh, just came from the Google Meet about the facilities committee and uh, feel uh, a little bit more informed uh, right now about the, the different options there. Um, I think, you know, it's great that the committee explored a, a lot of options that are out there. I think it, um, when the cost started to come in, that was a little bit humbling to think about what the initial allocation is and then what it would cost even just to get the base level of the track up and running. Um, so I think I, I like the, and would support uh, the option of getting at least the track project up and going, and then thinking about the turf in a phase two, because it looks like the track project can build the foundation from a drainage standpoint uh, to make turf happen. Um, there's tons of students that do track. And uh, one of the things I would encourage us to think about is how the, the high level of inclusivity of track can also help some other complementary goals in the school district, especially relating to um, anti-bullying. And it's a, an incredibly inclusive sport. And so I think we need to think about the mental health and other aspects of track that can frankly complement the education and create the social and emotional learning components that we're looking for for our, our students. Um, we were talking about net zero as well, that facilities committee. And I think um, turf would probably need to be something that is discussed from a net zero component. Well, what are the materials and the life cycle and the, how, it, it doesn't sound like maybe we'd get 15 years of turf and then you'd have to replace it again. Um, what are the uh, pollution energetic uh, elements of that? The, we might want to think about that from a net zero standpoint as well. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, worth thinking about and then also are there other better locations for other existing fields that would maybe make more sense to do turf than necessarily where the track is i don't know but it's just a question that comes to mind um but i really hope that uh, as i shared in the other committee and I'll, I'll share here that we don't make the perfect the enemy of the good if we have a great project that we can move forward with that gets us moving the right direction and benefits a lot of folks and also i think all other sports and um, gym classes would benefit from the track as well, that I hope that we'd find a way to move forward. I also think there's a lot of public enthusiasm. There's a lot of track users that are not even related to the school who I think would be very excited community members and hopefully also willing to pitch in and do whatever fundraisers, bake sales, whatever we need to do to find the other funds or frankly writing grants. Um, I saw a big plaque on the tennis courts showing what how funding was achieved through that and that makes me wonder if that might be another funding source that we could tap into to maybe fund the track um so i'll i'll leave it at that but i hope that we keep moving forward and uh, make good things happen so thanks you all 
Thank you, Jim. Uh, Matt, again, please introduce yourself for the camera. Sure. I don't think my video is working, so I want to make sure the audio is working. Yeah, audio is working fine. Um, no, no biggie on the camera. I'm sorry about that. No uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Smith. I am the parent of two boys, one of which graduated from Montpelier in 2020, uh, Peyton Smith. And then I have a, also uh, another son who's a graduate, who graduated here in 2024, who's a, who's a junior and uh, resident of Montpelier and uh, extremely uh, proud to be a part of our community. Uh, I wanna start off first and just say thanks to Libby and thanks to our school leadership, uh, both you know principals and vice principal, principals of past and then the school board as well, uh, especially over the last two and a half years, uh, it has been a very tough going. And we recognize that it's been tough going and we're very appreciative of uh, our leadership all the way up to including the superintendent and then all the way down through our school board to make uh, to make what's happened happen over the past two and a half years. We specifically moved to Montpelier uh, from overseas where I was in the Air Force for 29 years. And my final assignment was at Norwich uh, University where I served as the, uh, the professor of aerospace studies. Uh, and I also served as my final year, the Dean of the College of National Services, uh, which was in charge of all, uh, all ROTC cadets uh, at, uh, at Norwich. And it's through that lens and that context that I would like to voice my support for the track and field uh, infrastructure, just to include the turf aspect of the, uh, the field. And like folks know, uh, college is a year-round uh, endeavor. And for, for me, in that role that I served down at Norwich, uh, I was there every day uh, through winter, spring, summer, and fall. And I can tell you that the turf field at Norwich uh, saved our curriculum, especially during the COVID time. In other words, having a field in which we could go out on that was plowed because you can plow a turf field and be able to go outside the dorm and to be able to do all the, the things that we needed to do to maintain a safe distance and so on and so forth was incredible. And uh, you can be out there rain shine. Uh, there's no, you know, there's no mud issues. There's no, uh, there's no field issues. There's no maintenance, uh, large maintenance considerations uh, other than just, you know, again, just moving the snow out of the way in the wintertime, which it does obviously snow a lot here and winter is it's a large portion of the school year. And I can tell you just from the leadership role that I was in uh, at Norwich and having used, utilized that field nearly every single day from about mid-August till about the second week in May, uh, it was a game changer. And I can tell you, again, being a coach, both at the middle school level here in Montpelier and assistant coach helping out our baseball coach in the high school, I can tell you that the fields have been a struggle. And I applaud Matt Link and his efforts and also some private donors to, to, to make uh, the fields, you know, much better. Uh, the fields writ large to include scoreboards for, you know, Peyton Smith Field. Uh, and it has gotten better. It's not, you know, it's, it's not exceptionally dismal. So I don't want you guys thinking I'm painting the picture that this is not, we are, you know, that we are in dire straits. We are making those improvements. But I think at this point in time, I think we have an incredible opportunity to really put some time and effort into that track initiative and also into the turf field, uh, which will bear, I think, just incredible fruits of our labors and our funding and our resources for years and years to come. And, uh, and you know, it'll also take pressure off the other fields and allow our limited maintenance resources that we have at the school. And Andrew LaRosa is one of my favorite human beings uh, who's amazing, who's going to give a presentation here, you know, shortly. And without him, we wouldn't have a lot at this school, just like we wouldn't have a lot with all the other, you know, folks that are support our MRPS. But I just wanted to unequivocally, you know, support this proposal. And I look forward to hearing from Andrew. And again, thank you very much to our school leadership and our school board uh, for their, their leadership. And uh, I know sometimes it's a thankless job, but I just, from my perspective, my family's perspective, I'm very thankful to be here in Montpelier and be able to be a part of our community. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. Uh, I think that concludes public comment. Don't say other hands. Oh, a bunch of people showed up. Um, yeah. Do you guys want to talk for a public comment? Do you guys want comment? to talk? Now's your chance, guys. Well, you could also email us. You don't, Yeah. you have an opportunity now, but. We will. Uh, we will. Yeah, I mean, he talked about 
covered it pretty well. I would say, like, even though I'm not going to be here for it as a senior, like, I think a turf field for the, uh, the kids coming up would be incredible. Like, so many different uh, sports teams could use it. We could practice there all the time. We could, like, relieve, uh, like, pressure on, on the other field. Like, the backfield that we practice on sometimes is, like, really, really hard to practice on with, like, the bumps and the divots and whatnot. And so we've resorted to going to Dog River and practicing there. And half of it has a baseball field on it. And people don't pick up their dog poop on the field. <laughs> And we have to bring a shovel from home to scoop the poop and put it away so that we can practice on the field. So having a turf field to practice on at our school uh, would be, like, I think really beneficial for a lot of our programs. Um, yeah. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Anybody else want to add? Great, thanks. Um, we will move on to we're going to con basically continue this discussion. And thanks, everyone, for, for the input. It's, it's very, very helpful. Uh, to Andrew. Did you want to speak? Uh, <laughs> we don't have to force you, Jay. Yeah, we don't have to force you. I mean, but... I'd be happy to. Hi, friends. Um, I'm sorry for uh, seeking in kind of late. But um, boy, I really appreciate Ronnie's and I'm sure others' comments around um, the impact that having a turf field would make for this community and the impact that it would mean and the extension of um, seasons and accessibility. Um, it, I, I know that um, there, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, questions either way, but I appreciate how this is something that doesn't necessarily impact my family, but I think about future generations. Um, maybe my youngest would benefit, like maybe, but at the same time, I realize that um, giving this outdoor space to, to our kids and making it available to them um, is, could just have a really significant impact. And I, 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 I want to say, as somebody who has um, dealt with and struggled with priorities and managed um, how, how do we spend public funds, right? I think that there's an opportunity here to realize the community good here. Um, and whether, and, and I, you know, I leave it to you to, under, to decide what's the best way forward, but um, it seems to me like this is some, I think that this investment in this in doing a turf field is, is the best investment for our community. So does it necessarily have to come from the, the district budget or is it something that could be bonded for? Um, and I, but I, I do think that there could be support. I'm confident that there would be support from the community because it has such an overall benefit for, our, for all of us, for all of our kids to um, to, to move forward with this. So I just appreciate you considering this. I, I, I get the, the investment piece, but know that I think that there's, um, that there is a broader community support around it. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I'll just Andrew? Oh. Yes, uh, you can come up and then we'll pursue the consent agenda. Do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I um, take a motion to approve the consent agenda. Do have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, consent agenda done. Andrew. So uh, I guess the. Uh, Anna, I sent you a, a document. I'm not sure we're going to get into that document, but did you get it? Check your email. I did, yeah. Okay, thanks. Like I said, I'm not sure we're going to get to that point. But uh, what I wanted to give everybody a, a little update of where we stand with regards to the track project and the track investigation. Uh, about two months ago, we met, we seeked out uh, a group of 
interested um, parties, uh, track people and athletics folks and a whole group, we kind of had a listening session where we kind of went through what, what are people's desires, what are the, the needs, what are the aspirations. From that, we met with Engineering Ventures, our, our consultant on this firm, an engineering firm out of Burlington. We've done plenty of tracks in the state. Um, and we did three exercises. We did a, from, from the discussion two months ago, it was, it, there was a real desire to prove, proof out what an eight lane track would look like and how it would sit on the site. And we, we kept it to sort of a paper doll exercise of moving it around and you'd be shocked at how much space an eight lane track really takes up. It takes up a lot. And they, they tried that. And uh, yeah, we found some tortured locations, but they ended up making a very short home run field for the baseball field. And how you, you know, if you moved it here, put that there, oh, you'd how do you, how do you how do the fans even get to that event? So it really wasn't a very viable option. But we we proved it out. The other two options was a six lane track with an eight lane straightaway in the existing location. Uh, an alternate on top of that was what would a turf field inside of that look like. Um, they went back and they did some, re-looked at some of their cost estimates and uh, we looked at a little bit more about, um, you know, we talked about concession areas and, and picnic areas and food trucks and all kinds of different things. It, it sugared down, and I don't know whether we want to show that document or not, Lynn. Uh, Lynn. <laughs> um, Are you talking about you, you, if you want to show it, we'll show it. I'm happy. Anna's got it. Okay. Do you want to? Copy. Okay. So when it all, when it all sugared out, <coughs> um, we looked at, uh, Anna, can you bring that up? <laughs> Let's see if I have mine here. I do have mine here. So uh, we looked at a base project of being the six, a six-lane track with an eight-lane straightaway, straightaway and drainage to support a future turf field. A f the, the drainage support is not as dramatic as you'd think. We, we would be doing drainage on, a, on the track anyway. A turf field would be permeable. Um, so it would be sort of just upsizing a little bit for those sort of every 100-year storm kind of things. Uh, there is going to be a need for a maintenance building, so we separated that out. That is, we're not going to, as much as anything, the athletic department is going to need that storage building for all the mats and vaulting equipment and all their equipment on this new, on this new field. So we've invested a lot in the last year in uh, maintenance equipment, and we're going to continue to do that, and it's shown results. So we need, we need a facility for that. So when you take that base project, um, that basically comes down to about $2.4 million. If we were going to do that, pave a, pave a track out there and create a, a replacement area for the facilities and maintenance equipment. On top of that, you're probably looking, if we're looking to do the lights, all new lights out there, and the lights are sort of a, a piece that we need to do a little more deeper dig on. It's probably another half million on top of that. So when it all comes together, um, to do that, you're looking at finding another anywhere between 900000 and a million and a half dollars beyond the million and a half you've already committed towards this project to get the eight-lane track, grass field, new maintenance facility. That's, That's and lighting, is that the high and end? And the lighting, and the lighting, the yeah. The high end is with the lighting, yep. Yeah. And that number, I think, is, there's some, the high end, I think we've got a little bit of flexibility on. But um, if we were to add a turf field, if you just boil it down, a turf field's going to be about $1.7 million on top of that number. Um, we put in about, you know, there's all that support, support area that we have. Uh, there's been a desire for a press box, and our, because we're in a floodway, building a whole new structure out there is not a good idea, so I think we'd end up modifying the, the, the grandstands that we have. Um, and a concession area, the concession stand that we have now, would not, 
I think would end up having to be demolished, not that there's much to demolish, but um, the idea of setting up a proper, you know, concession area, really the consensus has been more like we need a place that we can maybe serve some food. A, a barbecue pit might do just as well because we just, that's a little more flexible, a little less intense and, and would probably serve our needs. And then a, a picnic area slash shade area, a place for people to gather out of the sun, place for the kids to go when they go. Because if you come here on any given day, if it's, the weather's a little bit inclement, they're all crowded underneath the, by the concession stand finding a dry place to put on their sneakers. So something of that in nature, but nothing super formal. And, I, and then, again, the lighting piece. And that number, I think right now, the engineers and I talked, we think that number is a little bit artificially high right now. It's just big pieces of metal being shipped long distances, and I think that that number might actually come down a little bit. And I think there may be some incentives that we can track down on that sort of thing. But that all in, you know, if you looked out there and it was new lights and it was turf and it was track and it was concession and it was the whole Megillah, you're like 5.3 mil. And so that's about 3.8 above and beyond the 1.5 that you've already committed. Sorry. A couple of other just things to consider, things that we do need to consider, um, or that are still in consideration. Um, if there is any hope of, of sort of getting this project going and, and breaking ground next year, it's a decision that's gonna have to be made quickly. Uh, permitting, design, bidding. Um, the, one of the good things kind of out of this new um, construction environment we're in is you don't have to put bids. It used to be if you get a bid in right after Christmas, or right after New Year's, it was great. You could be the first one. Nobody's bidding a project six months out. They're not gonna, nobody's going to commit to the price. So you actually have a little bit of flexibility. But it's it's a, the bidding environment's a little bit odd right now, um, but the other thing that we need to we'll have to just consider moving forward, just so people know, we will probably lose a season, either at the beginning of the project or the end of the project. Certainly for track, probably for one of the field sports, we either have to start the project early so that by the end of the summer we can get our surface in, so you can start the following year running on the track. Or we wait until the school year's out, we build our road and basically have to wait until the next spring to do our paving. Now, that option, I think, actually helps us with regards to the soccer, the lacrosse season, because it doesn't really impact. We're really just waiting, waiting to get the surface in. But we probably wouldn't get done until pretty close to the end of the school year anyway. So we're, we're going to lose that. This is something to keep in mind, and we'd have to go through that. You know, the turf field, um, um, it's uh, the maintenance of it and replacement cost of it. This is a field, this is a surface that as, as uh, James, I think it mentioned was, you know, this is a surface that's gonna need to be replaced in 15, 20 years. Um, and it's gonna be replaced at about half the cost of that insulation. So, so whatever the future value of $800,000 is in 20 years, we're gonna be looking at that and we're gonna have to do that. Uh, track surface, again, is sort of 10, 15, 20 years. That's much, that is not nearly the replacement cost as the turf field, just because you're kind of just laying a new surface over the old surface. Um, so can I just, just to get clarity on the cost. Um, yep. Track, no lighting, about 2.4 million. You add lighting, you get 3.1 million. You throw in a turf field without lighting, you're at like 4.7 million. You throw in a turf field with lighting, you're at like 5.3. Yeah. 5.3 also includes the concession. Yeah. 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 And I, I just wanted because because to some degree the turf field absolutely because what we'll do, yeah. what we would do is if we waited to do the turf field at some point, we'd build a bridge over our track, so trucks can go over it to move things out, and that's going to be a not a very tall bridge or a very long one, but it's going to be strong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The press box concession picnic, we can, we can make that happen. That's nothing pivots on that one. And the same thing with the lighting. The, the, um, the lighting. And our lights aren't broken. Right? Our, our lights aren't broken. Um, so it's just there. They were put up in 73. So it would be nice to get something a little more energy efficient out there and all that. But we could, we could do that. That's outside of the track. So that's why I kind of broke so, those out. 
So then in terms of like available funding and commitment and timeline. So we have 1.5 million right now that we have committed, which puts us about $900,000 short of the smallest project. And if we do the 2.4 million first, can that be done? It sounds like it can, I just wanna make sure. Can that be done in a way that would allow us to do the other projects later? Yes. So we, so we could stagger this. I, uh, yeah, that's why I broke them out like this. Yeah. And so we could either figure out the funding later or, I mean, would it be, and you might not be the person to answer this, it might be Christine. Um, yeah, the, the obvious funding source beyond what we have is a bond. Uh, how does the timing of a bond square with the timing of moving this? Well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting chicken and egg thing. Yeah. You know, do you design a shovel-ready project while you figure out how you're going to pay for it, and you've you've risked the money you've invested in design, but when you get the money, you're ready to go. Um, so that's that's kind of that that piece you need to figure out. Um, is a I may be talking completely. I'm I'm channeling my inner uh, brain right now. It takes a little while. <laughs> yeah, it does. Like they don't, they don't just, they don't just. Uh, I mean, Yabby has to get it approved, but there's yeah. there's hoops with the banks. Oh, to how long to go out and put it get together and, and yeah. that process? Yeah. I think we'd probably be able to do it by town meeting day, but I would. Th uh, yeah, I think that's a, a few months kind of thing. You, you have to get real enough numbers that people are confident that you're gonna what you borrow is gonna complete your project and all that, but. That's, it's not, that yeah. seems. Mia? Yeah. Um, could you be a little bit more specific on the need to make a decision soon? I don't think you mean like in two weeks from now, but do um, you mean by the I, end if of I the was If I was channeling my <laughs> inner civil engineer, I would say, yeah, if you're gonna build in a flood way, you, you got permitting that you're gonna have to go, and you have to have a design that's pretty well sorted before you go get those permits. Um, so I do believe if you were, if you had intentions of trying to break ground, even on the most big, now if you say, if the, the decision is we want to do the turf, well then that, that, that all goes out the window because that's a whole nother level of discussion because we have to decide what kind of turf we're going to do. We're going to have to decide if, if the turf goes into the, you know, if we get a flood, all those little granulars in that system, what happens when they go into the river? So is that the right system? So. Again, I, I think if you decide that you want to do with the turf option, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you would have any expectation of being able to break, break ground next year with the turf decision. There's just still a lot of work to be done uh -huh. on that, yeah. a lot of discussions. And you're going to have the, the, the people that use it, what's the best turf? You're going to have the environmental concerns. You're going to have to find, you know, so that's the pressure's off on that decision with regards to that. But if we were to decide to not do the turf right now, what would you say is a dead, could you, could you give us a deadline? I would say, but no later than November 1. Oh. <laughs> so like four weeks? And if we went later than that, what we're talking about then is we're just waiting a year before we would break ground. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm out of think. So what are the financial implications for the 1.5 million? Um, that it's already set aside. If we were to say we're gonna wait a year, do more, more decision making processes. Um, is this? Um, I know that we had to rush to put this one vote on this 1.5 million. So like, can it just sit there until the rest of the process gets? I think that's the the best person to answer that question is Christina, okay. who's not here. So. But however, if I use my just critical thinking skills for a minute, the, and I could be wrong on this, so I just want to put that out there first off. The, um, you all uncovered that money last fiscal year, mm -hmm. I believe, correct? Yeah, it was about a year ago, yeah. yeah. It was last fiscal year that that money was encumbered, and it's held over for this fiscal year, right? So I would imagine it could be held over again. Um, however, Christina, may very well have a very different answer to that question. So, uh, uh, no, thank you. Um, the other question I have, so I'm trying to understand, um, so some of the things that came out, the environmental impacts around the turf, um, and all that will come out of that, 
and but also thinking holistically so when you say we put over a bridge around the track what does that mean like it, it's is it like more money to be included in this two point million um the bridge would only be one one lane uh -huh. it's not it's not and around the whole thing but oh um yeah. it certainly is going to cost more to do it do it later and you have to work around things. You can't just go clear the site and do it. So, so the 1.3 million that we put in here was there are firms that it's what they do. It's almost a turnkey type system. They'll engineer the whole thing out. That's there's pros and cons with that. The pro is it's all done, and, and you can, the the con is it's done by somebody who knows where and when there's a problem, who are you calling? So. Our engineers would be happy to design it for us, but they'd also be happy not to have the liability of it. <laughs> so um, I think that's a very, I think you absolutely would have to, to, to add a, a little extra kicker in there. What that kicker is to do it five years from now, you know, is, it, is this just the inflation or is it inflation plus a little something? I'm sure it's inflation plus a little something, just because it's the logistics. Construction is all about the logistics. The building's the easy part. It's where do I pile this pile of dirt while I try to build here. Yeah. And if you've, got to mill, if you've got to move it way over there versus just over here, that's just time and money. So short answer, doing it all at once is gonna be the most cost efficient. Staging is gonna cost more. What that number is, I don't know. So my last question is, if we were to do it all, what is the timeline around Bonding, how does bonding work, and um, what happens it, when the environmental questions come around, or like all these things through that process? That, that's why I think it would take an additional, it's going to take, if we, if we went with a turf option, I think there's just so many questions about that, and just the level of sophistication of permitting and, and stormwater design and all that, that it's just, it's, it's more than just a road that you can run on. Okay. And I think just... um, what about maintenance costs for, for turf and um, as opposed to what we have now with uh, just a field? That's a good question. And um, I would defer a little bit to Matt here as someone who's been at Sabine Field and has seen what maintenance there is. But Certainly, uh, there is going to be, we're going to have to, after a, a season of shoveling, you have to, if you do the, the sort of typical ones with the crushed up whatever, you know, you've got to collect it from the sides, you've got to re redistribute it. Uh, you've got to clean it every now and again, I'm presuming. Um, but I think it is definitely lower. It's definitely lower. Um, the good thing, it would be much, this would be a much easier discussion if our soccer field and our main field was bad. You know, if there was standing water and rocks and all that, it would be a much easier discussion because it would be a no-brainer. Uh, Matt and Kim have done an amazing job on our fields this year. Um, and that field... There we go. How does it play? It's, it's all right. It's definitely not one of the better fields we play on all year, but it's not, like, the worst. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's right. that's. The the grass. Grass. Yeah. If we said it was the best grass field, we would say, "Well, why are we replacing it?" If it was the worst, we'd say, "Of course, we're replacing yeah. it." Um, the good thing is, is we're working with uh, Chip Stevens at, at uh, Diamond Tech, who takes care of the Mountaineers field and U32 and our baseball field, and we have we're committed to running, doing a sand layer every now and again to help level things out. We're committed to fertilizing twice a year to get the grass stronger. We're, we're, you know, if anybody who came out here at the end of the year, Tom and Kim were out there um, auguring, for lack of a better term, the soil around the goals and all that to get the grass growing early this year so it was nice and strong when we came back. Um, it's, again, it's all sort of anecdotal on my part, but at the end of the lacrosse season, you, know, you go look at Spalding's football field and it was in tough shape. I came and looked at our field and I was like, yeah, our field looks pretty darn good. So. There's going to be, and there's going to be some specialized, and there's going to be things like repair. You know, we have to protect that field, right? We're going to have to put a fence around it because, you know, somebody drives, not, not to say this happens, but somebody drives on a soccer field, 
You go out there, you rake it up, and it's a pain in the neck. Someone goes out and blows donuts on a turf field. I, I don't know what the repair is for that. Um, and again, that's kind of a insurance as much as anything else. But so that, those are the questions we, we still need to figure out. Okay. So, but th do you know the comparison? Is is the turf field eat uh, lesser? Co it costs less to maintain the turf field, or it costs more to maintain the turf field? And what's the I don't know, maybe you don't have the answer. Um, uh, the, the difference, are we talking about $10,000 difference? Are we talking about $100,000 difference? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And I, the only thing I can like, I say, that I can, it's a lot of anecdotes of people who have fields, and I think Matt Link has actually talked to some athletic directors who are very, speak glowingly of their fields and how maintenance-free they are, and, and you just go out there and you use them. So anecdotally, it's actually cheaper to maintain the turf. Potentially. I think it's cheaper until there's a catas something catastrophic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. okay. And um, how much, we, we mentioned, or, or I heard a bunch of times it mentioned, that the, it's, it's gonna expand the season. Is it year round that we can use that? Or is it expanding for, you know, 20% well, more? That, or, or well, that gets into, that's another, that's a, that's a good question. It certainly would help in the spring. I mean, we had teams that were chomping at the bit this year to get out there. I mean, we, we, if we had a turf field, we could have been out a month before, uh, I mean, we canceled two weeks worth of games before, you know, lacrosse player. Um, we, we canceled two weeks worth of games because it was, the weather was beautiful, and the, but it was still wet and everybody was doing it. So I bet this year we probably, probably could have gotten out there two months early or a, a, a month early before the April break. You know, the plowing in the wintertime and all that, um, I'll be honest, I don't know what you plow that field with. My guess is it's, there's got to be a little bit of a specialty equipment to that. And um, Matt would have to speak to, you know, what are, we, what are we practicing out there in December? I mean, we're kind of in indoor sports at that mode. Mm -hmm. um, so Matt would, would probably speak to, if we, if we did it in the wintertime, what would we use it for? Um, but certainly early spring. Yeah, a couple of commenters have brought up revenue opportunities from having a turf field. My understanding is South Burlington was able to generate some revenue. Do you, have you looked into that at all? I mean, is this a project that, that could over time pay for itself or at least pay for part of itself? See, Maybe. the thing that, that I struggle with sometimes is the fundraising and the role. That's five million dollars. That's a lot of that's a lot of tournaments that we don't have a lot of parking for. That we have to pay a lot of staff to run traffic. For. You know, I'm I'm not sure how much you charge to run a tournament. You know, if you're charging thirty thousand dollars, maybe it is. <laughs> yeah, if you're charging thirty grand, five million dollars. It's one point six for the turf. To be clear, folks, it's one point six for the turf. It's five million for the whole package. I I want to be clear. Yeah, but I, I'm not. I, we haven't done that analysis yet. I guess a um, budget question, but if we do go with whatever we go with, that's and that gets our budget up. Does that increase the per, per pupil spending? And if it does, then does that adversely affect the funding that we get from state because we are now way mm. above um, what the average is or what? There is a there's a formula there, right? Well, that, we have a bond now that we're in repayment of. I don't believe that affects the per people spending. No, it doesn't. I, no. I, 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 I say that with 90% confidence yeah. that it doesn't, but I, I don't believe it does. Are you talking about a bond, or are you talking about putting money for this into the general, like the ed, gen ed well, budget? In, in, in general, I mean, I'm just trying to get the feel of if we go with the bond, oh, yeah, we don't have to worry about it. But if we don't go with the bond and go with the whatever funding there is, then, yeah, we have to worry about this other portion. I, I'm just trying to if get a feel If you don't bond that. it, then we're paying for it out of whatever we have in our fund balance. So if we, if we pay out a fund balance and, and the bond, then it doesn't affect the gen ed per pupil spending, which means it doesn't affect the, okay? I mean, the, if you think about the fund balances, money, the district is already collected through taxes and just not used, right? So it's not going to increase taxes if you use that part of it. Yeah. The bond repayment definitely goes, you'll see information about bond repayment in the budget 
Yeah, I, I, I remember that the per pupil spending was used in a formula um, when we get the the CLI and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so if the per pupil spending is way above what the average is, our, one of those factors go up, and which means that, that our taxes just go up. Uh, so I'm just curious about that. Uh. Emma, and then you had her hand up, Brett. Not yet. Not yet, okay. <laughs> uh, Emma. Hi, um, thanks uh, to everybody who came to speak tonight. I think it's really important to hear from the community when we're uh, making decisions of, of this nature. Um, I, a couple of things uh, to touch on, to play off of what Anna Kit was just asking. So if we, we've already earmarked $1.5 million from the fund balance, do we have another $1 million to, in the fund balance that we could comfortably put towards this project? No. So it doesn't sound like, for the, if we want to get the track ground broken on the track in spring, it is not going to be paid for by fund balance. It's going to be paid for but I, I thought that one of the options was to put the $1.5 million from the fund balance and then add a million dollars to the budget. Is that not one of the options on the table? Yeah. If the board votes on the basic piece, then we'd have to present the board with a budget that makes it happen. Does that make sense? Okay, yes. And then, and then the other option would be to bond the, one, the additional $1 million which could, which sounds like it would probably push the project out a year. I, 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 I have kind of the same question. So it sounds like the, what I'm hearing is that in terms of like getting to the 2.4 million, we have 1.5 million, we'd have to find 900,000. Is there any fund balance that could go towards that? It would all yeah. have to come out of. So at the end of the fourth quarter report from last board there's, there's member, a little bit, right? There's, it's 652. Yeah. Oh. 652,000. That's what is unresolved fund balance. Um, so I guess we could use some of that, but then the rest would need to come through the regular budget, which means our total budget goes up, which means, you know, we have to collect that. Reg taxes. Regular budget or. Bond. Our bond, yeah. My understanding is that we might be able to get a bond done in time to cover the 2.4 million, but if we wanted to do the whole thing, we'd probably have to wait a year because there's just a lot of questions on there's a lot of design questions. The design questions on turf. I just so, have, I have oh, a follow ahead. up on yeah. that. The, at the end of the f at the fourth quarter report, there was also there was four hundred thousand dollars that had been reserved in FY22 as to cover things that maybe we hadn't anticipated that we thought we would need to transfer from the fund balance that we ended up not. Are we, can we add that to the yeah. 625? Yeah. So, so really what we're saying is there's 1.025 1 of unreserved fund balance. Some of which we have to keep. Right, yeah. and that was my next yeah. question. We have to have at least two and a half percent? In policy. Something we to, don't to, actually. So we can't clear all that out. Yeah, right. we, we we actually can. It's not our policy to do so. We do not have a mandated 2.5. We have a recommended 2.5. So we could dip a little below 2.5, which puts us into like dangerous territory somewhat because then we do not then we our rainy day fund goes away. But um, we could bring it down to like 2.2 or two if we wanted. What well, I guess the recommended or the what we have used is two. We end up with 2.51, the 652 is 2.51, which is 130K above the two, is what the fourth quarter report says. So our not mandated, but recommended, I think is two, what we have yeah. always talked about. Is 2%? Is 2%, and that's, uh, the what we have now is 2.51%, uh, which is 652, I'm not counting the other right. ones out there. The right. 652 is 2.51. Can so you give me a solid number amount on what's the 2%? What is that? That's uh, it's about five hundred and twenty. So we're talking like maybe like mm -hmm. I'm, my math my math skills are not great. We're talking like maybe if we bring down to two, like a three hundred k gap gap or so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Right, sorry, the 
What's the gap? Say that I again. said if we if we brought our fund balance down to two percent, adding the four hundred thousand to get to we're at, we're at like a we're like at a three hundred thousand dollar gap. Yeah, we need to yeah. be in the room that has the whiteboard walls. Yes. <laughs> I, seriously, I. Can't. I it's can't follow this math in my head. Favorite room in the house, <laughs> me ever. That's, that's so I'm, I'm a good clarification. Right. This two percent is two percent of what? Total budget. budget. Of the total budget. Okay. A, a, a total annual operating budget, right, for our yes. district. Okay. okay. Which is about twenty-six yeah. right. million. Um, I, I'm not clear about the four hundred thousand, but it's if it's four hundred thousand, you add the six fifty-two to that. That's over one million. The the two percent is about five hundred and twenty, so we are five twenty less. Not three hundred, but five twenty. Right. So it's five twenty that we could borrow, which would bring us. I don't think it's the shortfall. So that brings the shortfall to like three, four hundred. Yeah, three to four hundred thousand dollars. Where is that four hundred coming from? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm that's, not that's, the, that. that's that's what we would have to make up with general or no no no. no, no, no. He's four hundred. Where is in our finance? Committee report. Were you there, Anakin? It was. Time? It was some sort of over. We didn't use it. It was. It was money we didn't use. So it went to the fund balance. That's right. Yeah. Um. We had. Yeah. I, yeah so okay. You saw. Okay. Yeah. All right. So can I clarify yes. what timelines look like? So one timeline is we use our money, some of the money from the fund balance, and the rest we bond for March, and that is only for the uh, track plus maintenance. The other scenario is that we bond the remaining of the five million from the one point, you know, the money that we have plus, and we just bond the whole thing, but because we don't have enough answers to all the turf, we have to wait another year to be able to do that work? Or with the, the you sign? Can, you can release the, art, the engineers to, do, to get a shovel-ready project and, and have it sitting there for whether you do a special, whether you, the audit comes back and says you got more money and, or you bond it or you make it a line item on a ballot somewhere and you're just you're ready to go or it's two years from now and you got 90% of it sitting there and they just, when you, when you you budget for it. You budget, you budget, okay, we're gonna, instead of asking for X amount of dollars this year, we ask for 50% this year and 50% next year, and. Which if the difference is around $300,000 would make the most sense. You wouldn't wanna go bond. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you can just, you just make it the then. capital budget, basically. Well, the capital. windows are already taking that up. Yes. Yeah. Or we you should could add to it. Or, or you could add to it. You, yeah. you, could, you could, there's some other differences that you could use for second. budgeting yeah. pieces for that. You could ask for a $500,000 piece instead of 250. Yeah. Uh, That's ready. Red? What do we know about the waiting question? Yeah. We don't know anything more about, know the waiting about the waiting question. So we have potentially a foul storm, potentially there's really significant changes to how weights sort of play out. We're actually in a, you know, minus all of this, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a good state. We're in a good place for that. If we kind of clean out um, everything down to 2% and find $300,000 in our budget, we can make this project go forward. We can minus, I think, minus the, the turf, um, but do we make ourselves uncomfortably vulnerable in the event that the waiting process comes out and, and really hurts more than we expected? Is that, um, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna, I think we wanna keep all of the, all of the possible sort of pressures on the district in mind. Um, there's another one we haven't <laughs> Jim's either. drawing it right now. <laughs> PCBs are also another pressure. Yes. Which PCB testing. Oh. oh. Yeah. The board didn't. <laughs> I'll throw it out there because this is the time to throw this stuff out there. One of the things that you'll see in the facilities report that Anna will be sending around next week um, is we got to do a roof study. We got to we got to really when uh, if you cast I don't know how many were here when the bond vote was 
brought forward, replacing this whole roof was, part, was, was on the slate. Well, what happened at that point was the understanding by the design team was not correct as to what the system could be used, so that the replacement cost went from X to four times X, so they chose an, so our predecessors chose an option that was half X, and they put a silicone coating over the membrane. Well, that membrane is still up there, and it's still old, and it's still shrinking, and it still cracks a little bit, and we get leaks every now and again. At some point, you're not going to be able to stay ahead of those. I, I'm not super concerned. I'm concerned about it, and we've got to get it on our radar. But also, it's the middle school. The middle school edition roof was put on in 1982, or whenever that edition was put on in the 80s. It's a ballasted roof, so the sun hasn't been beating down on it, but it's 40 years old. So that's something that we should, that this year, one of my priorities is to really map that all out and give us some realistic expectations of when we're going to be looking at that. Because that one, this one, when we get a leak, we can go up there and we can find it, and it's easy enough to take care of. Um, over there, a ballasted roof is a little more difficult to get up there and find the leak and, and plug it. So I think once that one starts to go, it won't take too many years of it being a real pain in the neck before we go, we gotta get, we gotta switch this. Now, luckily Union roof is good, Roxbury's roof is good, and most of Main Street is, is good, so. Um, but. Kristen? I have a question just about like order of operations. So uh, like what comes first, the permitting or the bond? I mean, if you're gonna launch a bond on something, right, you're trying to drum up public support for things and you wanna know that you have a project that's doable. Um, I don't know what kind of hiccups could come up in the permitting process. I don't know if you foresee anybody, but I'm just curious, like do you kind of cross your fingers and hope the bond's gonna come through and in the meanwhile, you kind of just have the permit you know, process underway. How does how do those two things interface? They would get. They would very early on. The engineering team would go to the the permitting, the the, the jurisdictions in, in question, uh, and say, "This is what we're proposing. What do you see? What do we?" They would not go blindly and hope it's going to pass. They would work very closely, very early on, and we would have another. We would hire a cost estimator, in. December to say where are we at? What are we doing? And then we'd have we'd hire another cost est the cost estimator again in early February, mm -hmm. so that before you put in your warning, we got the best information we have, and we'd put a 10 to 15 percent contingency on that. Now, luckily out there, also the other thing just to let you know, we've we've uh, retained Stone Environmental to do some environmental testing out there, make sure that we've got clean soils and we don't have to worry about that sort of thing. Um, they're also doing that at the middle school playground, just so as we go over there, we have a, a sense we know it's sort of a proactive uh, measure. <coughs> so we would we would move forward in this, and uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't just say go for it and hope for the best when the bids came in. We would we would cost estimate it. They would work with the uh, they would work with uh, A and R and whoever else they have to get permits from, mm -hmm. and uh, we would have a professional cost estimator look at it twice. We would also. A lot of the projects that we're going to be doing, and we have to work through this a little bit, is we would maybe even, depending on the funding, we would get a construction manager involved as early as possible as well that can help us with the cost, that could actually really say it's, it's not the estimator, this is actually how much we would charge and work with the design team possibly on this project to say, okay, well, let's do it a little differently. This one's a little bit different that I think maybe just probably a straight bid would be the way to go on this because there's really nothing an asphalt roads an asphalt road and nobody's got a different a different solution to three quarter inch crust stone and three quarter inch crust stone you know it is it is what it is do we do it does that, do we have any reason to believe that the soil might be contaminated or that became quite an issue not here other than it's just and it's contaminates the wrong term it's and I'm getting a little bit above my pay grade here, but it's, it's urban soils. We could take, we could have taken the soils at Union Elementary and spread it out on the State House lawn. It was not dirty soil. It was soil that was in an area that's, that was designated urban soils. And take this all with a little bit of grain. It's soils that are in downtowns when they used to burn coal and have, you know, it was the soil that's here. And the real restriction is you can't, we couldn't take that soil and bring it to the stump dump. We could spread it on the courthouse lawn, but we couldn't take it to the stump dump because it wasn't designated 
the same area where the soils came from. This is, we believe, this is a green site. This is never, the, there wasn't anything here before the school. So there's really no, other than sort of just the residue coming from the air, but there's no burnt down buildings or old coal storage bins or anything like that here. No. Um, and again, Main Street, it was a neighborhood. So I don't think we would find any of that kind of stuff. But it was, it was a little neighborhood that was burning coal for 100 years. Yeah. So. I was going to say, I lived behind Main Street for a while, and we had our soil tested. It was actually pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, but, but again, but, that's, but that's, that's why we work with engineers in the design of things, so we balance the site, so we don't have come up with a design that says, okay, we got 200 yards of soil to get rid of. We incorporate it into the design, so you don't have to get rid of it. Brett? Um, I guess, how, how does the bond process work, first of all, and secondly, has there ever been a sort of dual bond process where you just put to voters, would you like to fund 1.8 or would you like to fund 3.8? I don't know. They're not, not really. No, we wouldn't do that. We um, would make a decision before then. Uh -huh. We'd get the community input beforehand. And I'm going to admit that um, I've never gone through a bond process. Jim, you have, have. as a former board member or before the Montpelier Roxbury public schools came about because I came in, Andrew and I both came in when that bond was being realized. So when construction had started five years ago. So neither of us were here for how the board went about that process. Yeah, the only thing I remember did, is it, yeah, it took a little bit of time to align all the yeah. pieces. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. there's, there's it, it, in, in thinking back to my days of, of doing these sorts of things is, is you know, you really tried to, you know, you, you, you went to town meeting day to say, do you want to do this project? And the town said, yeah, we want to do it. And then you had the business manager got to work with the bond bank to have the bond ready to before the contracts were signed in the spring. Yeah. What's, what's the downside of waiting a year? Cost. Cost. The cost, yeah, it's, gonna, it's just going to get more expensive, uh -huh. and it's just a year of not being able to use it. Right. Joe? I was just wondering, one of the main reasons we were exploring the turf field or doing things to the interior field when the track project first came along was we thought it would provide some, like, efficiencies if we're already moving dirt and we have the machinery. Is that reflected in this third column? Do you think that's captured that that, or is that presuming all other... Is that presuming if this was a standalone? I think project? that goes to, to her comment before. Like, are, is it going to be? Is it fundamentally? Is it going to be more expensive to do it in two steps versus one? Yeah, I'm sure. Right, but is that what we're looking at? No, this is this is if this is if you want to add it on this project. Okay. One point three. Okay. Or the one one point six. And with, with that expense, because it sounds like it's just not practical to do. Like, we don't really have the option in terms of where the design is to decide to do the whole thing in a year, no. including the turf. No. no, and I think we would, this is, this is a major project. Yeah. And you would, want, you, would, you would want three turf reps coming in here and talking with the athletic director to say this is what it is and, and saying this is our knee injury report and we would like to whatever, when, the, when they come in and say, yep, the, our little granules are, are, are safe for the environment. And we say, well, this is in South Carolina, this is Vermont, so our level of what's considered safe might be a little different. Prove it to us, what, you know, what really is in these things. And, um, and the, river, the river's gonna cover it at some point, we all know that. Uh, <laughs> Environmental lawyer over here. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, well, really, it's, it's, it's the, the, the difference is when, when the, in somewhat, <laughs> in somewhat cavalier, what the engineer said is you're building a road and you're gonna cover it with some smushy stuff. That's what the track is. It's, it's building a road and, and putting some, so it's not that big a deal. This next level is you want to make sure you do it right. So, so kind of my follow-up question is if the advantage to moving on the track portion with the option to do the turf field later now is cost, do the efficiencies of doing it all at once make up? Is there a likelihood that it could make up? Do you fight? Do you ever win against inflation? I yeah. don't know. 
I, I, my guess is it's hard to predict. It, I think it's hard to predict right. because if it, because if there was a hard answer, everybody would outweigh inflation or every, I, just by the nature of people build. I mean, look at inflation now in construction and people are building like crazy. You yeah. Know? Now uh, it's a little bit different here because we're not making money on this. So. And and when are we going to know? whether we have to tear this building apart for PCBs. <laughs> we are not slated to be tested for PCBs, Andrew just said, for a year. I think the first buildings start in 2023. 20, no, no, they've already tested CAT. They've already tested No, no, our buildings. Our buildings. Yeah, no, we've gotten our schedule. And it was, I think that one or two of the buildings are next summer, and the other two are the following summer. Montpelier High School and Roxbury are the two that are up first yeah. because of the date in which these buildings were built. And to the summer of 23. That's what they told us. However, they have already pushed it back. They have They've only done out. four buildings, I think, so far. They've done six. Six is not what it is. Because they have funds to support if yeah. there is a change. They did put 2.5 million. Yeah. Nobody can access that right now, including uh, my friend Mark Tucker down in Cabot School, who okay. can't use his gym at the moment. Okay. Um, they. They had no plan on how to get that money out to schools, and so it's just sitting there right now. And Tom Flanagan in Burlington would really like to access some of that money too, and he's not going to, you know, like that money will be gone with the first rounds. You know, they tested six schools, yeah, two of whom money. had PCBs at a higher level than the state put. So mm -hmm. chances are that money's going to be extinguished before we get to it, before we test. So I just wanted to summarize or reflect back, um, and because it, it seems like we're kind of winding to the end of yes. possibly our conversation. <laughs> um, we heard from a lot of parents. I've spent way too much time reading about uh, artificial turf, which is not the same as AstroTurf, <laughs> and the impact yeah, on student athletes. Is, is and gone. yep, um, I've heard from a lot of student athletes, their parents, from coaches of other schools. I've heard some really compelling reasons why a turf field is actually a good idea, including that it might be one of the few things that if we invest money in, it might actually bring in revenue. Um, there are entities like Capital Soccer and other surrounding schools that would rent it, um, and that there are um, any article you find about injuries and things like that, you can find articles that dispute that. Um, my friend in Newton, Massachusetts told me that they've actually banned all artificial turf in all of their parks and their schools. There's a big lawsuit in Martha's Vineyard if anybody really wants to go down the rabbit hole. Um, but I just really want to want to reflect back that we really heard a lot of really compelling reasons why it actually does make a lot of sense. We heard from a lot of people. We heard from students. Um, I literally, you know, I, I feel like I've sort of waded into this because I feel like I thought it maybe was an opportunity because we had the track coming in and we had that support. So I feel really torn because I feel like we have a lot of good momentum and support for this. It seems like it actually could be something that would be a longer term investment. It could draw students here. It could be another sort of asset to this community that would actually entice folks to come here, even though I don't know anyone who could afford to buy a house in Montpelier right now. So I don't want to be short sighted. That being said, I do not feel comfortable making a multi-million dollar decision, especially when there is still so much unknown um, in one board meeting. So I, I just felt like it was important to reflect that, that we did hear from really invested, intelligent people in our community who really wanted to advocate for this. Um, and you know, the reality of what's coming down the pike is really hard to, to wrestle with. Yeah. Thanks for going down the rabbit hole for the rest of us and summarizing that for us, Jill. Um, I, where I'm, just where I'm at right now and my thinking could change on this is I definitely, definitely don't, we can't make a multi-million dollar decision in one meeting. I actually feel pretty uncomfortable about making it within one month um, because in addition to everything that we have heard and I, you know, and I am in favor of us having a, a new track. I also think we have to take the financial considerations, even of the base um, option, very seriously. And I would like to explore the idea of using bond money for the base version, maybe the including the turf, and 
new roof things. I remember that the bond that we did that was sort of the marquee item was the playground, but there were many of uh, many other things that were included in that. And it feels like let's use this opportunity to have a broader conversation about what our facil facilities need for the long run rather than try and scramble and grab the last of our reserve funds to cover just the the small the base i shouldn't call it the small <laughs> the base version of this plan um because i think there are other options for our reserve funds that we're not talking about and um and i want to i want us to do a project that is a real investment in the community and not just be like oh okay we think we can get this done and we got to get it done really fast so i i just my, my where i sit right now is i would I think waiting a year is a bummer for those of us who are, who are, you know, our student athletes who are currently or very soon to be in the system, but it is also only a year for us to really figure this out. And, you know, I know that that was a real, that was an experience that the kids who were at Union back when we started the conversation about the playground, it was a real shame that the kids who were there at Union and were like, good, we get a new playground. We're actually in middle school by the time the playground happened but it is also sort of the reality of this is a complicated <laughs> um issue and it's it, and i think we should take the care and time that it deserves and amanda did too um i will just sort of like echo the same sentiments that uh mia and jill are bringing up and just ha being on the facilities and energy committee there was a lot of information provided um, at that meeting and the last meeting that has not even be been discussed um, at these public school board meetings that just raise a lot of uh, questions, you know, around whether this, we should move forward this quickly on this project. And one of the things that um, I'd like Andrew to sort of, um, I don't know, reiterate or explain is that there is a replacement cost. So when we're talking about revenue, potential revenue for a turf field, there's also a replacement um, window. I think he said about 15 years and about $1 million, but I want Andrew to speak to that. Um, so that would be, you know, probably $70,000 to $100,000 a year if you break it down like that. You know, if we have to replace the turf every 15 years at the cost of a million dollars then that really puts that whole concept of a potential revenue into different light. Um, so I would need to understand all of those questions and, and financial implications a little bit better before feeling comfortable moving forward, even with um, the base plan. Alanda? Do you want Andrew to answer that? Or, or is that uh, not? It's, it's, it's uh, fundamental again, go back. The, the track, we should anticipate as we move forward um, that the, the a track and or and a turf field would need to be replaced at in 15 to 20 years, probably 20 years, we'll say that. Uh, the, the best information we had regarding what UVM is doing at the moment, um, it was sort of the half the cost of building it in the first place. Uh, so here it would be you know $800,000 in today's dollars to, to put a new surface on that. Again, the coating on the tracks, that's significantly less. You know, that's, you're, you're truly building a road out there. And you don't need that cost. You just you layer, layer another coat of, of uh, <coughs> surfacing on the existing. You don't have to even take anything away. So that's a good piece. I want to appreciate uh, your presentation and the committee that has worked so hard on this and Jill for reaching out to families. I feel the same kind of in the realm of really wanting to take uh, it slow and like get feedback and think about this bond issue. Maybe think of capital, you know, funds, how communities can support so that, the, you know, like, they're rich people that want to donate, you know, something like that, that we can get creative around, you know, people that really want to invest in this community and in this particular project so that our, the bond is not so much. I think that we can think about it. And I would love to see us taking it slow and 
Um, I really and love um, Chris Curtis when he was speaking about inc inclusivity and or was it maybe James? I don't know. One somebody was talking today about just you know the amount of students that can access both track and field, um, and not just having just the track, and that we can think you know how many more kids we can uh, provide these athletic opportunities to. So I would love to just for us to take it slow and appreciate all the work, but saying let's hold off and let's do it right for our communities. And let's see the big picture with all the other things. That's where I am. I would also echo that and I think it'll be helpful to see the facilities report in the next couple weeks is that coming before the board so we can kind of get some of those other big projects that might be on the horizon and kind of just pull those into context and I think echoing with Rhett said before you know I feel like we're feeling the tremors of Act 127 but there's really no writing on the wall yet but just based on like the Lincoln letter you know there definitely it was where it sounds like we're going to have difficult decisions ahead of us and and given that I feel like I would want to have a better understanding of that before going through um, this this reserve fund also right yeah, I mean, I think that if we're going to think about a bond, we want to be as comprehensive as we can be. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of pressures that we don't know about. There's a lot of bits of, you know, there's a lot of facilities questions. And I think that if we're going to ask for the community to make a big investment, we want to be as, as comprehensive and, and stable and sure-footed and confident in, in what we're presenting to people as we can be you know, for, for all of our buildings, and, you know, and, and I, I want to track as much as anybody, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm committed to seeing the process through so that we can have that track, whether there's a turf or not, I don't know, but, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm personally committed to making sure that we have a track that, you know, that's what we committed that $1.5 million for. I, I'm, I'm certainly committed to that. I just, if we're going to have to Put to put forth a bond. I want it to be smart. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think I concur with pretty much everyone people have said, and I think it also would be good to um, find out what the implications of the waiting study are. And I am maybe more worried about PCPs than others, but Burlington is is in Macy's, the high school, and they had to take out a what? Ninety-five million. Yeah, a, 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 a large, large bond. Uh, That's yeah, a bond to build a new high school. So, um, given the date this building was built, it is of concern. So, in terms of it's. I have. Hmm? Uh, for next steps for yeah. us to work on uh, gets more information about the bond process yeah. um, and what goes into that work and then thinking about it and next next board meeting will help as well because you'll see a next board meeting is, is to Andrew's annual facilities report so you'll get a broad overview of the facilities and we can start that thinking of if you're going for a bond you might as well go for a bond yeah, <laughs> and figure out what else is in that <laughs> uh, absolutely yeah, no, it, it, yeah, no, we should not use a bond for one thing to fill little holes yeah. or one thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny when, when they passed the bond here, what was that five million dollars? Yeah, it was seven, 56 up in Winooski, and it was 75. The original one for Burlington was 75, you know. And if you just broke it out square footage wise, we should have asked for a lot more at <laughs> that one, just sort of relative to. We're just being a little too modest at that one. But Andrew has said more than once if he and I were in that process, it would have been different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But and, and it's it's something that, you know, with this last couple of years, this is this is the new phase, right? This is we have to focus instead of just sort of playing defense, we we now with regards to facilities have to start playing a little offense and looking yeah. down the road. We're looking right yeah. in front of us the last couple of years. Libby, can you add to the list of next steps? I think if we're going to take the time, it's worth to ex exploring, as Andrew said, having three turf, I don't know, companies have a conversation with Libby. Should we go, should we start that now or not yet? Not yet, okay. No, no. We will. If, okay. we, if we go that route, if we decide to go down the bound, bond route, then we'll, yeah, those think, conversations Yeah, absolutely. Happen. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Once, once we 
this this was that first sort of let's look at the size of the the cake here and yeah, yeah but I, I think it's wish list time <laughs> if we're going to do a bond yeah, if we're going to do a transformative bond let's do a transformative bond i agree yeah i agree when, when i look at the forest right yeah. That we need, and I and so the bond. I, I would be interested in learning how it works with Raspberry too, like how mm -hmm. bonds work. In yeah. Terms of like yeah. That. And then um, they work like your mortgage. Um. Yeah. I I'll, I'll learn. <laughs> yeah. I'll be right there next to you. Yeah. <laughs> learning with you. <laughs> And I guess, that, is there infrastructure grants coming in or no? No, there's nothing? Not anything no. worth yeah. worthwhile. There, that's a big push for the Vermont Superintendents Association with the legislature. That is one of the VSA's pushes, is to bring back the infrastructure grants for schools because they were done away with quite a long time ago. Uh -huh. And because of that, there's a lot of deferred maintenance across the state. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's definitely on the top of mind. Okay. Yeah, I thought there was still an ARA round, a new ESSER ARA round of infrastructure Arpa, yeah. stuff. We've already accounted oh, for that. Federal, federal? Yeah, COVID relief infrastructure specifically. You want to send me that email? I don't think I <laughs> I don't think, I haven't seen anything on that. Okay. Maybe that's why I haven't heard about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Way back when we were talking about infrastructure federal dollars, yeah. they took that out. Okay. That didn't okay. make it pass. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the state. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to put it out there. Jill mentioned that there aren't a lot of people that can afford homes in Montpelier right now. There's a lot of space in Roxbury. <laughs> There's a lot of space. There's no zoning. <laughs> I just want to put that out there. It's well, one of the only like the places West. where there's literally no zoning. Like you can build anything you want. Nobody's going to have a problem with it. <laughs> there's a beautiful little school there. We take care of it, you know, for young kids. And then as long kids as that school is strong, you know. Come to this high school and eventually yeah. a gorgeous track and. Beautiful. Yeah, there's a lot of space. <laughs> Just saying. Good PSA I there, Rhett. Thank you. One last thought around, you know, how like the Montpelier just bought that country club? <laughs> Has, has the school district ever collaborated like with the city council around like types of property like that? Like, it's so beautiful to oh, play soccer sorry. over there. Well, it used to be, Andrew, that just made me sad. <laughs> <sad. laughs> <laughs> Libby can speak more to this. I mean, we used to, the city and the school district used to be combined and then by statute we had to separate. Yeah, okay. And we still work with them a great deal. We use Dog River Fields, they'll use our gyms in the winter times, things of that nature. Okay. Um, but we're, we're, we're separate at the moment, and we're separate by statute. But uh, we still have a good, great relationship with them, and we help, one, we help each other when we can. No, but I think you're right. One of the people who had mentioned that we have less fields than we used to, and it was true that part of why I think the community supported the, the purchase of that property was the idea that there would be community rec fields that could be used, so that might help also alleviate some of the challenges here if we can use that the way we used to use the rec fields, I mean, long term. And, and the, I mean, the little kids are playing soccer over there. And oh, it's okay. beautiful. It is beautiful. I wonder about how we get our athletes there. Yeah. For after school practice. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's, we don't have to have that conversation yes, right now, yes. but uh, it's a good point. I think Matt's done a great job um, with, especially with getting rid of the mud lot, that we have that extra heel field here for the middle yeah. school. So we've done, we've tried to get everybody here, and it seems to be working pretty well. We do, again, we do use the Dog River, but the Dog River site isn't maintained as well as, as uh, our fields, clearly. Our fields, yeah. Yeah. But uh, not much flat land in Montpelier. Yeah. For gym space. Yeah. I wonder if the state, yeah. would it, sorry, and then I'll okay. stop pontificating. There are a lot of parking lot spaces that we used to fill up as state employees that remain empty. I'm one of the few state employees in my building that comes in. I wonder if there is like a potential down the road to turn one of those parking lots into another field. I mean, it's just wasted pavement. So I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to BGS about that one. You and Andrew Stein get on it, will you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think they'd be happy. They're selling a lot of their properties in town. 
Let's add it to the bond. We'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> buy a parking lot. Just kidding. Just, Just kidding. kidding. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Andrew. This is this is. Thank um, you very much, Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, super helpful and. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a firm board commitment to all these projects. We just want to do it right and do it efficiently and um, know what we're getting into and know some of these unanticipated near-term horizon possible costs. And there'll be a quiz on the uh, facilities report, so make sure you read every, <laughs> 70, every one of those 78 pages. I did last year and I will this year. Luckily, <laughs> a lot of this is the same. Thank you. So it comes out the better I'll study it. <laughs> so we have equity committee update. Who's you doing want to that? Lead on this, yeah. So we have been looking at um, the SBA uh, released a small grants opportunity for equity projects, and uh, we've taken a look. And one idea that we have that we wanted to get some feedback on was. Um, and pursuing a process to arrive at kind of a working shared understanding and definition of what educational equity is in our district um, and such that you know we have our DEI policy it doesn't necessarily have like a stated definition of educational equity in it it sort of gets at it in a couple different ways but um, you know thinking about that just as collectively as a group so that we are really kind of working from, you know, the same starting point when we're thinking about, you know, utilizing our um, beloved equity lens policy review tool and that. So we're starting from, a sh you know, just a, a commonplace of, of understanding what equity is and what it looks like in our district. And, um, and I think that would then kind of really I think folks might have a feel like they have a, a stronger understanding then of, of why we have the equity policy review tool and just kind of center that. Um, our committee did a lot of work on that and um, I don't know what its kind of status is in, in being used elsewhere, but I think we'd love to see that, um, you know, just have a life beyond the Google Drive. And um, yeah, so that's, we're hoping to just get a little bit preliminary feedback from folks. Do you think that's good use of the grants are $5,000? It is due October 17th which is fast approaching. Um, but they do ask for us to get some board input, you know, um, you know, did you get the go ahead from your board? They would like for us to also, you know, have, have you had a conversation with your superintendent and is this in collaboration? Does it feel like this is a, a collaborative um, effort? So that was our big update and wanting we could always send it around if people want more. What would you spend the 5000 on? I think facilitation. So oh, okay. having, you know, like a, a couple, one, ideally two to three workshops and say like a, we were thinking it wouldn't be ideal to stretch it over, you know, weeks and months, but, you know, try to accomplish, you know, some kind of intensive workshop um, activity in, you know, over the course of four to six weeks, four to eight weeks, and trying to arrive at that definition. Um, so yeah, outside consultant to run a process. Any thoughts? Makes sense to me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do we need an approval? And from Lily too, for the grant? I think we need like the buy-in basically. What the SBA wants. Like well, board, kind like of like uh, some of the questions in there is like, have you talked to is your superintendent on board with this? Is your board on board with it? Right? Is that yeah. the question? I don't know if we need formal action. We just need a, a check in, which I think we. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was essentially a nod. They weren't acting, yeah. you know, asking yeah. for a letter or anything, but that we've had a conversation. There's buy in. We're kind of aligned as a board and with our superintendent that we have like a clear unified objective. And just as far as timing goes, the due date of the, for the grant submission is the 17th, which is before our next board meeting. So yes. we were just hoping to get sort of like, yay, thumbs up from the board if you agree that this is a good idea, that we should pursue this. And then we could work between now and the 17th with Libby to finesse language and whatever to have it fall within parameters that would be both like how the grant is structured and also be something that it's as the grant says like a collaboration of the board and the super and you know what the administration is doing just like we wouldn't it? we wouldn't have time to come back to the board in a board meeting mm -hmm. to say look at the actual grant submission but i don't think we would need to either 
So it does ask, has the school board authorized the application for this mini grant? Is it a collaboration of the school board and the superintendent? And have you notified the SU, um, sorry, SD business office manager? So, and those are just like check, yes, no questions. What's the timeline beyond 17? When's the grant going to be awarded and what's the timeline beyond? Yeah, so decisions are made by October 24th, uh, where notifications are made by the 31st. Funds must be committed by June 30th, 2023 and spent by August 15th, 2023. So it's got a you know, fairly significant timeline, especially for a pretty small amount of money. June? Next year, yeah. Yes, they would need to be August, committed by August of committed next year. Okay. Yeah, and then used by uh, August 2023. So it would give us the time to find someone, mm -hmm. make a plan for what the, mm -hmm. um, what it would look like. So, we have a concept right now that we feel pretty good up about, but it gives us the time to solidify that. Mm -hmm. So if we got them. Yeah. Right. So if we if we got the grant, then we would look at doing something in spring or summer of next year. Okay. Just trying to get a sense. Mm -hmm. Is everybody feel okay with that? Yeah. That a blessing. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good. Thank Thanks, you. President. Sure. Thanks, Secretary Committee. Um, bullying prevention discussion. Mm. I think why this is to. Uh, um. Yeah, so I've just been thinking a lot about, I know that a lot of the community members are doing, you know, uh, Dr. Hauser and the Old Brain Big Long had a little webinar or like Zoom meeting just to hear about, you know, what people thought as what we can do as well, and I didn't listen to it, unfortunately. Um, but I know that um, we had a, other, some parents that sent us, some comments, uh, and um, what's her name? Oh, forgive me. She's, um, what's her name? Adrian. Adrian sent us like a little chart of what some of the ideas that they had. And I, I thought, so I've been thinking about like what our role is. And um, just hearing from some of the parents about what the gaps are and then having our training, I wanted to suggest that we, as a board, do a series of community listening sessions for the next few months. Um, and we can do it individually as groups just to hear like what ideas we can do um, to work with the, get with the community to kind of tackle this problem that we have. Um, and and maybe to find out about what those gaps are from their perspectives, right? Like I know that we're, you know, the administration, DB and Jess are doing a lot of work and I appreciate that, but I, I feel like we need to kind of fill that gap between the parents um, and just communicate, communicate and be able to be responsive. Um, perhaps what that looks like at the end is a collaboration with the parents groups around some sort of magical thing that can happen with our kids. Um, so that's what I wanted to bring. I think that I will be willing to support and do an, a, a few community listening sessions just to you know, hear from the community and for us to kind of be a little more involved to tackle this. Um, and so that's the discussion I wanted to have. Or that's what I'm proposing. Starting out with listening sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just say I I think that's a great idea, and I would be also be happy to sit in on them or help organize them and and attend. Um, I went to one that was caregiver organized, and it's clear that they're just it would be really helpful for the con conversation to keep keep going um, and a conversation in a way that's far different than we can have during public comment at a at a board meeting and um, I have I've 
started having lots of ideas of what we could do, but I also feel like it's um, before trying to act on any of those, we should do more listening and, and discussing with the community. session out in Roxbury um, in a couple weeks on October 16th um, so it's certainly one of the things that we can you know mention you know ideally you know, I think it's inviting people into the room to have them bring things up that is you know is, is current and happening for them and also you know mentioning that we're aware of there's been some dialogue of and that we're just we're available so mm-hmm I think it's definitely good to hear from the community. Um, sounds like you want to take a lead in putting those together? Yeah. 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 A month, a few board meetings ago when we last discussed this, you floated the idea of some outbound communication. You know, we hadn't like solidified anything. And it, it strikes me that one thing we could do that would be in conjunction with this and almost like an invitation to join them would be an, like an op-ed in the local papers that is a, you know, we, un, we recognize that this is a problem and we want to do what we can. You know, I, I don't know exactly what it would say, but something like that. And it, would, it could conclude with an invitation to join these. Anyway. And is our... Um Process that Jim writes up at for the board, or is there? I mean, I can certainly. I think if the board agrees with someone else's write up, that would be fine as well. Um, we could co write it. Yeah. This makes me think of, um, I don't know if this might help sort of fill out this sort of outgoing communication, but. Libby, you had said something about how there's a need for community. At one of our recent board member me board meetings, you said there. You said you you that the the phrase learning loss is out there, and you feel like there's a it's more of a community. There's a loss of community. Um, I. I kept that keeps that has been bouncing around in my head a little bit, and I was wondering if you would just expand on that a tiny bit. I wonder if that might help any of the kind of communication that comes out from the board about some of the needs that are out there. That I don't know if that if that yeah, do you think that that some of our concerns about um, the sort of social emotional climate that's out there predate the pandemic or is there an element of the community loss that occurred that sort of has been fueling some of these behaviors and some of these some of these problematic circumstances that we see for some of our families i mean some of our kids it doesn't feel like the pandemic made you know made it easier for kids that were struggling uh, in the first place i don't know if that you would never say that there was not social-emotional learning needs prior to the pandemic, because there certainly was. Yeah, well, I know. A lot, you know, we don't want to idealize that time period like the 1950s are idealized, right? Wow. <laughs> because there are a lot of things that we were working on in school systems with kids around social-emotional learning then, too. I, when I say community loss, I mean that kids, particularly our adolescents, were becoming more independent without mom and dad right next to them and being in groups of friends in independent situations is possibly one of the biggest places of learning for kids. They make a whole lot of mistakes doing that. They, um, and peers help correct those mistakes. <laughs> you know, in the moment they know, they learn how to talk to each other in a different way at that stage of the game. Um, and that was done in a very different way, if at all. So some kids, Many kids didn't have really any way to do that kind of communication. I think of my kid who went through the pandemic as a sixth, seventh, and eighth grader, right? 
did interaction, but it was all over the online, right? So we, we allow, we, we let, I don't know if I'll, anybody else did this, maybe, but as a parent, like, we let off all our, like, rules around technology because that was where he was interacting with his friends. And we could hear him laughing and screaming and doing all, all the things that we wanted him to do in that instance. However, it still has an impact on him because when he's sitting around and we're like, go hang out with your friends, he almost doesn't know how to do that, right? Whereas for me, when I was young, like, you just went out and saw, found somebody who was around, you know? So it's a completely different mentality. And that's what I mean by, like, community loss is that I have a ninth grade kid now who, and, a, and a sixth grade kid who don't know how to call a friend and say, hey, what are you doing? You know, like that's hard. That's a hard thing for them to wrap their heads around now, um, and that's just my kids who are who've done pretty well, and you know, throughout this whole thing. So, um, I think that our kids now they're coming together. We didn't we didn't do a good enough job last year when there were less restrictions in place with no pods and all that kind of stuff, of of anticipating that they were going to need more restrictions. Right? We tried to make it as if there was no need for that. And there, there's still a need for it. And then we slowly have to scaffold them back to knowing how to interact together in uh, masses. And it's exacerbated by the fact that the technology we have cuts a lot of the end. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, if I wanted to know what a new album look, felt, the, uh, was like in 1984, I had to find a friend who had it and had to go mm -hmm. hang out with him or her and listen yeah. to it. <laughs> I couldn't just press a button on a phone. Yeah. Like, yeah, if I wanted to call a friend, I would have to call, I'd have to probably interact with another family member, like a parent. I would have to like have that conversation. I couldn't just send a silent text. If I wanted to know what my friends were doing, I could not look it up on Snapchat. Yeah, there it's are, a there whole are, different world. There are so many social interactions and opportunities for social learning that have just been killed by this device. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a whole different world, and it, it was exasperated by <laughs> but it was exasperated by the pandemic. You know, I, I can yeah. keep talking about my kids. My, my daughter is one of the most lovely people on earth, and I promise you she is. She, she like, takes a picture of her face, face, making a weird face on Snapchat, and then puts her phone down. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what did you just do? Who did you just send that? That's weird. What did you do? <laughs> like, why don't you just call them and talk to them instead of snapping a strange face? Like, it's just bizarre, you know? And then you look at her Snapchat feed, and... All of it, like that's how they're almost communicating through yeah. weird faces. Like, so it's just, a, and it's part of it is I think the adults trying to wrap our <laughs> heads around this. Um, and so this is kind of the lightweight part of like what's happening right now with how our kids are communicating. But there is a heavier side to that too, that when you say something that's nasty or belittling or demeaning or whatever into a video game with a group of people who you don't know who you're playing with, right? And you've been doing that for a year and a half and then you get in a classroom of kids who you can see them and you still say the same things, that's bad. You know, like they're, they haven't learned that kind of interaction. It's like unchecked experimentation. That's a beautiful yeah. way of saying it, yeah. yeah. You know, and it, it is, I mean, it's just participating. Anyway, it's a diatribe, but like, it's, it's, I mean, they are separate and not, you know, I mean, I think the two compounded is, has us arriving in a place that feels pretty treacherous for some kids yeah. and pretty formative, but you know, we and had not Joel maybe the best Van way. Lent here, when we had the half day, Joelle was here. And uh, Joelle and I both share the same opinion, but I feel like putting Joelle's name behind it has more weight because she's much smarter than I am in this, these things. She's like, the kids are going to come. They're, it's going to come around. You know, they're going to settle. Yeah. The, we're going to, you know, our first graders, our second graders, our third graders are mm -hmm. back in where they should be in school with friends, you know, learning how to do this kind of thing. So it will settle down. Um, and what do we do in the meantime with kids who are mm -hmm. making some decisions socially that are not appropriate? Yeah, I mean, this makes me think about how, um, you know, in terms of like, right, what can we do? What's like, what's within our purview? And I know there's, there's been some discussion about doing more, you know, direct like family outreach and workshops and things. I mean, I think there's a lot of parents swimming out in the abyss trying to find their way through this, like not only just like the iGen-itis, you know, that, that plagues a lot of our kids and them trying to sort out their, their social worlds with all these, you know, these, these new tools, 
Um, but, you know, in addition to kind of hearing from them, it would be great if the district can really do, I mean, I can remember that growing up. I mean, there was workshops for parents, you know, as we think about how we can kind of partner with each other as a school district and parents and come together to have a shared, better understanding of our kids and where they're at so we can better, right, education, a certain percentage happens in the school building and a lot of it happens at home. And so that how we can be working, you know, in concert with one another and having these shared understandings. As a board member, I would be interested, you know, how we allocate funds to such things. Which is why a community listening yes. session around this specific topic will help us kind of yeah. frame those conversations because I think mm -hmm. uh, the culture shift also starts at home, mm -hmm. right? And how we have those conversations with the kids. And so I think of what's acceptable and what's not. And, and I think, you know, this is a beautiful community. Uh, and there's a lot of people that want, that are really open to have conversations, and I think that a lot of beautiful things can come out of it, of like, just like, you know, listening and kind of trying to come up with solutions that then we can bring together, uh, whether it's for the budget or like for grants that we write together with, you know, PI or, you know, some of the community groups, whatever it is that we need, but hear from the people that are on the ground. I feel like um, there's a lot of solution-oriented people too, not just and that we can learn from um, and that we can bridge that gap a little bit, so. Yeah, no, building opportunities for social interaction, because Liv is absolutely right. Like, Kids, kids learn by doing, and they learn by interacting, and they learn from each other as much as they learn from adults, especially as they get older. Um, great. Well, thank you for bringing this topic up, Amanda, thank and you. for um, sharing some leadership here and uh, getting. Just and, one yes. more question: uh, Are there? Um, I know Murph's Pie. I understand that there's some kind of grant or funds that they have, and they were sort of reaching out to maybe Anna or something. I'm not exactly sure. I heard through third hand, through my wife. I'm not, a, I'm not so connected. I don't know how. Are there uh, I can answer. There's $5,000 that uh, was a grant that Pi received last year that has not been used for social and emotional learning. So there's a lot of ideas that are coming up around doing workshops for mm -hmm. parents, around bullying harassment and like so th it, it wasn't clear how that money could be spent and it kind of just sat there so now it's like we need to spend it it's i mean we don't need to there's no timeline but this this topic also seems like a one that a lot of the pie groups want to invest some of that in there so and i think you um they had conversations with Jess already, kind of like trying to collaborate around some of that stuff. Thank you. Um, policy monitoring. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the B8 electronic communications between employees and students monitoring report? I make a motion to approve the monitoring report. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, executive session. I will put the language in for you. Yeah, I put it on uh, the agenda for you. All right, I got this. Okay. <laughs> Need Thank to, you. This looks like it's like combined into one motion, don't it? Don't we need like two motions? We do. Yeah. First you three oh, you may. Okay, you can do it in one motion. No, you need. You need, you need two. Because this, this, uh, this, this is the first one. This is the hard one. The second one is just to go into executive session. Okay. Now we can remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I move that the board make a specific finding that premature general public knowledge of the positions that the board may take in upcoming labor negotiations would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage and therefore the board votes to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing labor negotiations with its employees and personnel matters. Do I have a second? I'll All those 
In favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So now we, I move we go into an executive session? Yes. I move we go into an executive session. Second. Aye, second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great.